the way you really test out a piece of work that you maybe a painting you've done or whatever as you show it to somebody and uh, the initial moment when they see it if there's uh, you know a reaction and it makes you it, it's kind of an impetus to keep doing more w- what is truly underground well a truly underground thing in my opinion if you look at it from an old school perspective will be someone who's not on the internet at all now that would be underground for me in the june of 2022 and the only way you can discover that person would be to go find them physically that would be underground at the moment you know in 2020 when we all went into the zone of being locked down get, get on our cell phones and grandparents had to see their grandchildren and people had to work and um, you had to talk to your friends and everyone just went online uh, we, are, we are a very visual species a lot of what we are it's a very visual thing if something if you look at something it's a photograph or an image or a piece of music and if it moves you and you're looking at it in your own way and that's the purpose of the artwork anyways the purpose of it is not for everyone to feel the same about it the entire purpose is you know to evoke uh, whatever emotion it needs to it's a modern world filled with all the razzmatazz and the toys and uh, but i also see uh, a sense of identity in a modern world you can also get lost so it's nice to have a sense of identity and maybe it w- it's cooler now to belong to a community which is not as large as maybe some other communities you know uh, this left wing armchair social warrior looking for the next cool social cause because you don't want to lose uh, brownie points with your equally woke cool friends you know in your echo chambers filled with your cancel culture hello everyone welcome to the inaugural episode of the indic underground this is a joint collaboration between the bharat vartha podcast a podcast on policy and culture and the indic explorer channel this is a podcast for young millennials and zoomers who are civilizationally inclined and want to explore the interplay of indic civilization and culture with modernity we will be meeting young intellectuals and artists who represent the very best of these values talking about underground and i can't find a better guest than the very first guest ari jay prakash an underground artist from the city of bangalore who is culturally and civilizationally rooted but still is exploring and experimenting with many different shapes and forms of modern art hi welcome to the show how are you doing today i'm good thank you very much for having me i apologize for the you know the internet connectivity but i am kind of up in the hills at the moment so you will forgive me and it's thank you very much for having me on your show and it's a pleasure cheers so uh, so ari uh, i want to start like uh, why don't you give the uh, audience a background about you know uh, yourself uh, where you uh, grew up where were you born uh, what was your upbringing like uh, and uh, how did you actually end up becoming an artist what was that journey like well i am at home at the moment in my studio in uh, the nilgiris which is in um, the south of india uh, the nilgiris has uh, uti kunor and kothagiri so i come from uh, kunor mm, this is where i kind of um, grew up my father was an uh, is a retired um, air force officer a retired wing commander i was kind of born at the military hospital in wellington which is like right next door and uh, this is my home i'm in kunor i come from a tribe which belongs to the nilgiris we are kind of a ethno linguistic tribe we are called the baragas amongst the different uh, indigenous uh, tribes in the nilgiris we are one of them we just got our unesco world uh, heritage certification as a indigenous tribe uh, last year due to the efforts of many amongst the tribe including my father and others well there are not many of us i come from uh, from an endangered uh, tribe who speaks an endangered language i maybe compared to the other tribes in the nilgiris a little 
I don't know, better off because the other tribes include the Todas, the Irulas, the Kurumbas, amongst others. And, um, well, some of those tribes, the Todas and uh, the Irulas probably just have a couple of, maybe a thousand of them left. So there are about a hundred and, uh, I don't know, maybe a lakh, uh, 40 range Badagas. So I belong to that tribe amongst the others in the New Greece. So I kind of grew up here and I'm at home and um, it's been a complicated couple of years. I guess everyone's kind of had to change their lives around the situation we are in with the pandemic and everything. So, yes. So, uh, Ari, uh, whenever this discussion comes up about indigenous tribes, and I want to delve a little deeper into this question, the conversation always comes into are the indigenous tribes in India, are they Hindu or are their religious practices different? Uh, so yeah, uh, I wanted to delve a little deeper into this question uh, because you say that you c come from the Badaga tribe and whenever there's a discussion on the indigenous tribes of India, the conversation often goes uh, into, uh, you know, this sociological thing that are they their own tradition or are they Hindu? So I want to understand from you, what is unique about the religious practices of the Badagas and how do you come like uh, where what is your thought process in terms of their presence in the larger Hindu fold? So we live in uh, different villages there are about uh, say around maybe 400 uh, villages we call them Hatis we do speak a uh, our language is called Baraga it's kind of a dialect of old Kannada and Baraga means uh, Northerner. So we have around 400 villages and different Hatties, was we 400 Hatties and we live in them. So the equivalent of that in uh, probably, so in Bangalore, you have, for example, different Hallis, right? Martha Halli and Kamana Halli and all the Hallis. Halli uh, means Hatti, means village in Canada. So we kind of uh, speak an old uh, dialect of Canada. There are different um, legends as to our origin. I guess the American, uh, I mean, the anthropologist Hawkins, who's written a book about the Baragas, uh, who did a lot of re research, but he does say that we are as, uh, I think his quote was, as ind indigenous to uh, the New Greece as the English are to Britain, you know. But uh, there is this theory that we migrated uh, from the Tala Malay Hills, you know, we, we are at the border, we are at the cusp of. Uh, we are one of the districts of Tamil Nadu where we are the cusp of the border between Mishara border between Karnataka and um, Kerala. So there is this theory that there was a migration that occurred uh, a long time ago. It was after the Muslim, I mean, during the Tipu Sultan time, I guess, where Muslim ruler tried to, there were seven siblings and there's a legend which says there, are, there were seven siblings and they um, kind of uh, escaped the ruler in that period. Uh, in uh, around the Mysore uh, region and uh, we kind of uh, migrated here but I don't know that's just one of the theory I think we are as old we come from uh, we have an ancient ancient um, link with these hills and I don't really uh, believe in the theory but it's kind of what is said and what's in the books but we worship uh, Hete. Hete means grandmother in our tribe so every grand grandmother in our tribe uh, we always call them uh, Hete an elderly person and a grandfather would be called an ayah. I won't like, uh, I'm not really, my dad is a major historian. Uh, my dad, Wing Commander Bari Jayaprakash, Prakash, he runs the most extensive uh, website. Um, you can ch check it out online. And he um, is a Barga historian amongst being, you know, the first Air Force officer from the Neil Greece, the first Air Force officer from the Baragas and um, the first Wing Commander from you know, these parts. And so he's a pretty accomplished. So he'd be the right person to get into the real details of it. Maybe it would be nice if you did an episode with him, you know, that'd be great. The tribes of the Neil Greece. But anyways, I, I, I'm pitching for my dad right now. But anyways, so we, uh, well, we are a small community. Like I uh, said, we live in Hatties and uh, we worship Hete. It's, uh, we are very, um, what would be the right word? We, are, we worship nature. We still, Hete is kind of the goddess of nature. And we worship, uh, we have Hete Habba. Habba means festival. 
So there is an ancient, uh, there's an old um, temple which we um, go to where we, where the whole haba occurs and the festival occurs. And, uh, you know, we have, well, our marriages are kind of short and not so elaborate, but our funerals, when you go, you get sent off in royal style. So uh, funerals are very elaborate. It's a celebration of one's life, the person who has left us and uh, it's kind of of course there is uh, the element of pathos in there and sadness but yeah our marriages are short and uh, kind of simple and uh, like i said we are not not too many of us and uh, in a modern world it's as a old tribe it's i guess obviously there are influences and the younger generation wants to you know go out and do things it's a big world with a lot of opportunities well that's the way it is and i guess it's the same you can say about any people, group of people. Firstly, uh, is there worship of uh, the other Hindu deities in the pantheon as well? Like, like you know, Ram, Krishna, Shiva, Parvati. Sure, we are Shiva believers as well, yes. Shaivites as well, we kind of worship nature. Hetha is our chief uh, deity. We also have Deva Habba. We have certain, uh, you know, rules in our rituals, in different aspects of life, for example, uh, marriage or birth of a child or uh, the naming, um, you know, ceremony or when you move into a house or all of that. We are very particular. We have certain, well, some are similar, but our chief, uh, we do believe in uh, Shiva, mostly Shaivites, and, uh, but our chief deity would be Hete. Okay. There's an interesting point that you uh, mentioned, Ari, on the youngsters moving out of town, right? Like going out for studies or for work. And uh, from the few Badagas that I know, many of them actually, because there was this whole uh, British, uh, you know, Anglo-Indians and a lot of British colonialists were living in Uti and they formed a lot of boarding schools and hostels, right? Absolutely. So there was a lot yes. of Angli Angli uh, Anglification like, you know, westernization happened very early over there, right? Among the tribe, a lot of people. And what I see actually among the younger generation of Badagas, and I want to kind of, uh, I, I want you to kind of weigh in on this point, is that a couple mm -hmm. of generations back, you know, like in the grandparents' generation, people actually westernized a lot. But in the younger generations, I see a yearning to go back to their cultural roots, what do you, uh, have you seen this and what do you think about this? Because it's kind of different from all other, commu like, you know, communities in this thing that the younger generation is actually trying to go back to the roots. So, yeah. Well, that's a very, very good question. And I think it's a very, uh, individually, it's a, personally, uh, uh, to myself, it's a great question because uh, my family itself, as a matter of fact, the room I'm in, uh, we have uh, from my great grandfather's period or my um, grandfather's uh, great great grandfather's period. My great great grandfather was uh, Rao Bahadur Beli Gauda, my great great grandfather, and my grand great grandfather was Rao Bahadur Adi Gauda. They were the ones who, who were very influenced by the British, and um, they were given these titles even by the British. And my great grandfather was responsible for you know you have a train here only in Darjeeling and in uh, Kuno. Uh, you have uh, the last team trains, you know, the Blue Mountain Express, the Newgury uh, toy train, which runs, which is pretty famous. So he was, he worked a lot. He's the one who laid the tracks for the train. Uh, he got the contract uh, with the British. He was also the first MLA from these parts and um, he was a very accomplished man. He contributed a lot. I think one of the founders of, not, I think he was one of the founders of Kuno. Contributed a lot to these parts. So the British, there is a lot of influence personally why I'm saying all this is because of the family I belong to. Of course, uh, the there is a lot of influence and the British came here because they thought the climate was conducive to how it was back home. They had the capital, the initial capital was in Calcutta, not Delhi, the first capital of India. And, and then over there, you found things, you know, more up north. Maybe Assam was apt for that kind of weather. Dehradun and Masuri and other places in northern India. So in the south, were the people who were posted, I guess, in Madras and in Chennai and when the summers hit and... There's this old uh, English saying, mad dogs and Englishmen, you know, it's a, it's a phrase. So where it comes from is uh, in the Indian summer during the British Raj, you would find only two kinds of uh, people out on the street. One, mad dogs, two, Englishmen. 
because it was so hot, no one would uh, go out. So I guess uh, they discovered the Nilgiris and uh, Kothagiri and they discovered maybe, uh, uh, not maybe, they discovered uh, Kunor and Uti and they, this seemed perfect, this seemed just like uh, back home. So, and even from a perspective of fauna, uh, sorry, from uh, perspective of flora. The eucalyptus is not native to this area or the lantana, you know, these, or even for that matter, wattle. So these species were kind of incorporated by the British over here and tea, tea of course, was their, I guess, gift to us. So uh, we are famous for the New Greece tea is uh, kind of world famous, uh, apart from Asa tea, you know, and Darjeeling in India. So there has been a considerable, it was in, I think, um, around 19, uh, the turn of the, you know, the 21st uh, century. It was probably in 18, um, the 19th century rather, in 1820 or something, where the, the administration developed uh, the hills rapidly. And to go back to your question, I think education was one of the aspects. Of it. So I also studied in a school in Lovedale, which is right next to Uti over here. It's called the Lawrence School Lovedale. And that is a gift from the British. It was founded by Sir Henry Lawrence. It's like a, almost a 200-year-old school. It's an old school. There, so there is a lot of uh, British influence in these paths. And uh, it goes back to the generation of, of course, I mean, the British were here for almost uh, 200 years now, you know around uh, the beginning or around 18, 18 19 uh, in the 19th century was when they came here. So we have a 200 year old relationship, I guess, with people from these parts, including the native tribes, uh, including the Todas, the Kotas, the Kurumbas, the Irulas, and us, we have an old relationship with the, the British, yes. The, the influence even with architecture and old colonial buildings is, Definitely, yeah, yeah. But has it has it has it changed? Like for the younger generation, is there a yearning to go back to the roots? Do you see that? Sure, there's a lot of yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's maybe not a phenomena that is uh, just common with the Baragas, but I'm sure it's a phenomena which is common with uh, pretty much every person who might belong to a small tribe anywhere in the world, you know. It's a modern world filled with all the razzmatazz and the toys. and uh, But I also see uh, a sense of identity. In a modern world, you can also get lost. So it's nice to have a sense of identity. And maybe it, it's cooler now to belong to a community which is not as large as maybe some other communities, you know. Maybe that um, has more of a charm nowadays. I don't know. But uh, yeah, that's just the world we are in. And that's uh, as a species collectively, that's where we're headed towards. And uh, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. That's just the thing it is. But some younger, younger people do. But to answer your question, the young people do. Yeah, they do kind of, uh, you know, respect their heritage. But they're out there in the modern world doing all kinds of modern things. So that's good. So how exactly did the decision of becoming an artist come about? Like, uh, how did you... Uh... Was it always something you were interested in doing or was it like a Eureka moment at some point of time? No, it was, I think, more uh, even as a child being very young, very young, you know, maybe four or five, whatever. Some people have an inc inclination to different things. And um, I just had, I was just drawing for a, from a very young age. And, um, you know, when you're, I guess good something when you're young you tend to hear that for a long while this guy's going to be an artist oh he's going to be an artist and from your perspective as well you've kind of as a kid you're doing something and you show it to somebody and you can see that i guess the reaction on their face and i think even as you get older even at this age uh, the way you really test out a piece of work that you maybe a painting you've done or whatever as you show it to somebody and uh, the initial moment when they see it if there's uh, you know a reaction and it's a reaction which is kind of you know makes them go well or you know it makes you it, it's kind of an impetus to keep doing more so as a child i guess i was well people would always say this guy's going to be an artist so i love sports and art so it was either going to be hockey player or in my tribe, um, there's an old saying, well, it's kind of a joke. There are two ways out. One is you pick up the hockey stick because we all kind of are great hockey players in my tribe, like the Kurgis. And, um, uh, well, or you hit the bottle, you know, <laughs> like most uh, Pari tribes. My tribe also might have some issues with, uh, <laughs> let's say, the spirit world. <laughs> 
that's a that's a nice pun <laughs> so uh, i want to ask you like uh, what so firstly what is the indian underground art scene like number 1 what is the indian uh, mainstream art and how is it different what what separates the underground art scene what are the key features and how rooted is the underground art scene uh, with indian cultural values like uh, is there some influence or is it uh, more of outside influences so yeah so well we are having this uh, conversation i think in an uh, interesting time we are uh, sitting in the june of uh, 2022 it's been um, well i guess a rough couple of years for um, just about everybody all around the world but what is underground anymore we live in um, you know a completely connected um, planet at the moment w- what is truly underground well a truly underground thing in my opinion if you look at it from an old school perspective will be someone who's not on the internet at all now that would be underground for me in the june of 2022 who's literally you there's no image of you know the art form at all online and the only way you can discover that person would be to go find them physically that would be underground at the moment what is underground uh, today i don't really know because you know everything is out there and uh, as an artist of course uh, if i do an artwork you know digitally or from a traditional perspective or if i wrote a book or i'm a musician who did a song and um, easiest way for me to have access to a lot of people um, you know observing my material would be to put it online otherwise back in the day um, i have uh, been in general compartments in indian trains years ago dragging a box of um, paintings to take it to different festivals to showcase and i used to live in calcutta i'd go down you know take a trip to bangalore with paintings out there or you know in rishikesh or elsewhere but um, as far as the indian underground is concerned so this term uh, came up i think around 2010 i was working on um, a book called the kuru chronicles which i'm going to release in a week's time online on my website so it's been like 10 years in the making it deals with a virus but we did a book before that in 2013 called kuru genesis which is kind of a coffee table introduction to the inspiration behind that so at that point in time uh, well somebody classified it as the new indian underground because uh, we were in that zone of anti censorship anti censorship it was something we uh, i mean that was a uh, we had a lot of political statements to uh, make a lot of subjects on um, corruption the system law enforcement gay rights state of the nation a lot of the, a lot of influences from uh, the tantric realm from old hinduism from uh, the vedic realm from the left hand path of hinduism from the philosophy of the agoris and the nagas and uh, you know all of those things a combination of all all these things and um, also uh, i mean the aim was to make sure it is uncensored so our visuals that we would use uh, uh, i also have a project called kuru circus which i was lucky enough to form with my dear friend chintan kalra chintan kalra is an indian legend he was the bass player for parikrama for almost 20 years and then um, he decided to move on to other things and we got together and we've been uh, doing this project kuru you know this band performance art setup that we have it's called kuru circus so we've been doing it for almost uh, over a decade now along the way we also became the first indian band to kind of push this in southeast asia we did a southeast asia tour in uh, 2018 and followed up on by another one in 2019 we were invited by the punk community in indonesia the underground punk community who i consider to be the last great punks on the planet because they truly are legit punks they live in the slums of jakarta and sukabumi and bandung and uh, uh, they're not really um, uh, how do i put it economically um, from a higher strata of society but they are the last original punks on the planet according to me so we were uh, you know a shout out to padang who um, is no longer amongst us the 
the one who invited us to, uh, on behalf of the punk community in Indonesia, rest in peace, brother. So the underground, coming back to your question, the underground element was to be completely uncensored and to explore the dimensions of performance art, of traditional art through imagery, which is might offend a few, but I think which is essential. And it's not offending you for the sake of offense, but it is just um, maybe sometimes too brutally honest and uh, too in your face. And sometimes it might be very subtle, but it's right, it's there. And uh, so someone once classified it as the new Indian underground. So in the questions at the interviews I did from maybe 10 years ago, my opinion was, I think one of the most exciting periods of modern Indian history uh, would be um, in, uh, when it comes to um, the creative realm, will be what we have produced as a nation in the past decade, from 2012 to 2022. So I always used to say from, to, and it's interesting that we're having this conversation in 22 because, well, it's an apt uh, time to make this statement again, because um, I think that's true from a perspective of a young, young generation exploring things in the realm of noise uh, art in the realm of uh, using digital technology to uh, try different things. And of course, uh, social media kind of changed the game and we are all in the algorithm at the moment. The coronavirus expedited that process. What would have taken 10 years uh, for the number of people to get online, it happened in a matter of 10 months. You know, in 2020, when we all went into the zone of being locked down and you know, the, get, get on our cell phones and grandparents had to see their grandchildren and people had to work and uh, you had to talk to your friends and everyone just went online. And uh, the coronavirus kind of expedited the process of, uh, I guess, getting online. So we can get into a whole realm of conspiracy theories, but let's not, uh, well, go there at the moment. So I, uh, so what are your uh, artistic influences, uh, both Indian and uh, from abroad, like what kind of influences do you have? And are there any influences from your tribal roots as well? Yes, I think my influences um, are very varied. There is uh, where I come from, my heritage. Uh, I'm a bit of the, uh, of course, a lot of that. Um, I have a lot of Japanese influences. There was a phase where I loved extremity. I'm a big uh, Takahashi, Miike or French New Wave extremity fan. Well, I love music perspective. I love everything from classical Indian music to <clears throat> Vietnamese metal to, uh, you know, K-pop and an entire spectrum of uh, things. I think it's good to explore uh, all the different art forms out, out there. And I love, I have a lot of influence from old school comic artists like John Buschema. I love because as kids, I used to love reading old Marvel comics and, uh, you know, DC comics and um, a lot of uh, influence from that realm. Uh, belonging to India, of course, having spent my time and life in extended periods across different parts of the country in different cities in Bangalore and Calcutta and Delhi and Madras and Chennai and, uh, you know, all these places, all the those influences kind of seep I think I'm a combination of my life experiences, uh, my heritage, of course, uh, being tribal, that, that has an influence where I'm from. I've also had the privilege of living in uh, cities like New York and Boston and Vancouver. So those influences are there. And it's a wide spectrum. We live in an internet world, so I have a, a large spectrum of influences. And uh, I'm happy for that. And I'm glad. So, it, I mean, you can, it's better to have a lot more influences than maybe not so many from an artist's perspective. I want to go to the next part where we, uh, which for a lot of people uh, is the most interesting thing when we go to an art gallery and we see some artworks. We want to, uh, you know, as a person who's looking at that content, we want to kind of understand how does one analyze a piece of art. So, uh, uh, Anirudh, if you can just put some uh, the photos of the uh, the artwork of the Agoris, the set of 13 images. So I want to kind of uh, uh, want you to help me navigate those so works. I'm going to interrupt that you, you there. So, you know, yes, from uh, someone who's maybe studied art history and uh, all of that, and uh, we, we are a very visual species. A lot of what we are, it's a very visual thing, you know, from the from the time we are born till we die, our most of our experience unless uh, until we are sleeping, where we 
dwell in the subconscious. But otherwise, most of our lives is very visual, you know, for most of us, of course. There are people who might not have the privilege of eyesight or hearing, but for most of humanity, a lot of our, us, it's a visual thing. So how to dissect an artwork? Well, without getting into uh, the league of being, uh, you know, like a pseudo intellectual, <laughs> I don't know how to put it. It's a very personal thing for different people. I'll put it this way. If if there were the three of us, you, me and Anirudh, maybe, uh, you know, two other people, two of our friends and somebody c- came and put a blank uh, sheet of canvas and gave us some paint or something. And they said the word love or they said the word hate or anger or whatever, you know, it's uh, all five of us would have a different interpretation of it. Say we are all very good artists. Say none of us are very good artists. Say one or two are great artists and the rest are, don't have a, are not really artists. So everyone would come up with their perception of love or anger or whatever the subject is. Who the hell am I to say or you to say or a critique to say that is not, I mean, that is your perception, right? That is you put your heart and soul into it and that is your, but I do understand from a skill perspective. Yes, sure. It does maybe matter, but how to analyze artworks? Well, that's, (laughs) yeah, sure. That has a a theory. I know I might be pissing off a lot of uh, art theorists at the moment, but yes. But all I'm trying to say is everyone's free to, if something, if you look at something, it's a photograph or an image or a piece of music and if it moves you and you're looking at it in your own way and that's the purpose of the artwork anyways. The purpose of it is not for everyone to feel the same about it. The entire purpose is you know, to evoke uh, whatever emotion it needs to, uh, to whatever, whichever individual it's, you know, an artwork could be an individual thing. A song also is an individual thing. It's also a collective thing. Oh, have you seen the, did you see that photo? Oh, check this out. Check out this artwork. Oh, have you heard the song? You know, so it gets collective, but before it gets collective, it has to evoke that emotion in that person who then, you know, uh, you can make it, you could take it to other people and then you enjoy that piece of art. So anyways, so yeah. Uh, I see the photo on was put up. Yeah, so uh, we have an image of, uh, can you just uh, tell me what was the story behind this? How sure. did you uh, make this? And uh... Sure, that's a nice image to put up first but because I think it's one of my more popular images. It's a very popular image. As a matter of fact, it's been stolen a couple of times. I think people have published, uh, use this image in books and... Um, all of that. So this was shot at uh, Babu Ghat in Calcutta. It was the January of 2010. So uh, during that period, there is a festival which occurs uh, in 24 Parganas, which is in um, Bengal, in West Bengal. And I used to live in Calcutta during that period. Uh, this was shot early morning. It's an Agori Sadhu, you know, doing the boom thing. So setting that chillum into oblivion, evoking Shiva, uh, trying to have a, going into a trance. I, I was uh, doing a series on Ganga Sagar on the Mela at that moment. But to get to Ganga Sagar, you need to take the ferries out of Babu Ghat, which is an area in Calcutta. It's, just, it's near Eden Gardens. A lot of people will know Eden Gardens, you know, the world famous uh, cricket stadium, the stadium, the legendary stadium. So this was shot at Babu Ghat. It was early in the morning. I got lucky because the light was just right. This uh, particular Baba was going into the zone. Um, you see the blurred... Uh, Mari Gold in front of him. It's one of those things. As a photographer, it's more uh, b- b- uh, the universe gives you uh, a moment in time and you're lucky enough to capture it. So this was one of the shots and the contrast kind of worked because of the red and the safa, they call it, you know, the chillum cloth that he's using and the Mari Gold oranges that are standing out with uh, b- this blurred in the foreground gives it kind of a depth of field and of course is Vibhuti on him, the sacred ash that uh, all Agori Babas and uh, Naga Babas wear. Yeah, I got lucky. It was one of those moments. Uh, I was doing a lot of photo essays on uh, the, you know, on Agoris. I was very uh, influenced by the left-hand path at, in that point in time and Tantra. And I was doing photo essays in Assam at Kamakya, at the Kamakya Temple, which is India's, big, uh, the world's biggest Tantric temple. And we'll get into more a little later, but yeah, that's what this image is about. This is also from Ganga Sagar Same. Yeah, uh, this is all a series. It's called Agora from years ago. You can keep uh, scanning through the photos slowly. Photos. Yeah, just scan through. Yeah. So some of them, uh, this is again from Babu Ghat. 
this is more a black and white. I was shooting on my uh, DSLR, a Canon DSLR at that moment. Uh, it was an old school one. Uh, yeah, this one is a very popular photograph. Um, uh, this is also, I remember once uh, I've been sent uh, paintings of this, which have been put on, uh, which have been there at the India Art Fair. I remember I had a friend call me once, Ari, I did not know you were at the India Art Fair. So what the hell are you talking about, man? I'm in Bangalore. So he was like, uh, no, you have an image is right in front of me. I'm looking at it. And I said, what the, I mean, are you high? What, what's going on? And uh, so then he sent me this. So this is a very popular image, which has again been, uh, you know, published many times. Uh, the same Baba who was blowing the... Is the person yeah. here, like, is the sadhu here trying to think so something? So the story or... behind this particular scene, you know? So this moment occurred... After the first shot you showed when he was blowing the chillum, when he was evoking uh, Mahakal, Lord Shiva. So this moment occurred after that. So I was privy to this moment. And um, I have a couple of photos from it, but uh, I guess this was, the whole uh, scene lasted about 10 minutes. So there was this rich uh, Calcutta businessman who had brought his son in front of this Baba. And um, it's about six, maybe six thirty in the morning. So the Baba's sitting there in the background. You have the uh, chelas uh, uh, who are sitting around him. So the Baba's in a trance. He's an older Gauri Baba. We never had a conversation, but I think we had a conversation with our eyes that day. He was also not in. Um, he's not Moni Baba, but that day I met another Baba called Moni Baba who hasn't spoken in many, many years. So as you go through the images, I'll tell you which one he was. But anyway, so this rich businessman brings his son, sits down and he whispers something in the Baba's ear. My son's got some issues. There's some problems, this, that. So the Baba does his thing, goes into a trance. And then the next moment was fascinating because it made me ask a lot of questions. And then he put his uh, hand, like most, when you get a blessing from a Naga Baba or a Guri Baba, it's not a blessing like that, you know, kind of a Jitero. It's more like a smack on the head. It's like a thought that you get. Uh, well, that's just, they follow the left-hand path and, you know, they believe in Shamshan Matara, the goddess of the cremation ground and Mahakal, uh, Shiva's version, you know, from the de destroyer from the deathly aspects from that version. So they are not really more the, how would you put it? The sattvic, the, eat, the more peaceful type. So, the, But getting a hit by a Baba is a great blessing. So anyways, he hit the guy and he started having fits. You know, the kids are having fits. So I was like, my man, is it staged or is it done? But in my opinion, I think it was very real. Uh, but across my travels during that period, during those years, I think maybe a lot of the Babas, maybe over 90% are not real, but there are absolutely legit, in my opinion, legit, maybe 5-10% who, yes, there is, I believe in uh, Tantra, if you ever go to Kamakya in Assam, I mean, it's an ancient thing, but I think it's a real thing, and it comes from an ancient philosophy, we as Indians should be very, very proud because I think there were about 46 ancient civilizations, all of the longest running civilizations, probably. All of them are gone apart from us. Maybe the Chinese, you know, the Mayans went, the Toltecs, the Olmecs, the Aztecs, I mean, uh, forget about South America, the Africans, a lot of the classical civilizations, uh, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, uh, you know, you don't, you, you, I don't think you'll find a, person who will worship Anubis or Ra or Horus in uh, Cairo today, you're not going to find uh, you go to Baghdad. Or Zeus. Or, yeah, or, or you go to Iran. I mean, uh, Iraq and Iran is uh, Zoroastrian, like Parsi land. It is a land of Anubis, of Ishtar, of, uh, you know, if you really want to go to Jibleki Tepe, the most interesting finds in the recent past when it comes to archaeology have been in Turkey, in a place called Jibleki Tepe where they found ancient uh, figurines. But coming back to my point, we are still here. We still are as passionate about Ma Durga or Kalima or Shiva or Murugan or uh, any of the gods that we have from Vishnu's to Krishna's to you name the god, you know, and we have a lot. So we still are here and we still, uh, I think that's an ancient philosophy. Uh, which still has outlasted, uh, I mean, invasions and uh, many different things. And, uh, well, we are still here. I think I also come from um, 
pseudo-scientific uh, belief system. Even though I believe in things like technological singularity and uh, all of that, we, I think we must be proud of our past. A lot of secrets, uh, ancient India holds, which are still a lot of people can't explain. And none of, nobody can explain today. Secrets lost in the past, maybe burnt, you know, when uh, Nalanda came down. All the Egyptian libraries were burnt, you know, and they had a trove of secrets back in the day. So, yeah, I think there's a lot maybe we don't know. And um, there is this theory where before a species reaches technological maturity, the species tends to eradicate itself. Uh, something happens. Uh, I think that maybe happened with ancient civilizations. But, yeah, I think a lot of my influences also include uh, that aspect of where I come from as an Indian, you know, from the parts I belong to as a human. Yeah, that's uh, really interesting. Uh, there are a few other images as well that I wanted to go through with you. Mm, this, is an, yeah. uh, this was shot at Ganga Sagar. This was, I call it the end of the world. Ganga Sagar is right at, in the Bay of Bengal. It's one of the, it's uh, Satipitas. So the Satipitas, okay, let me also, for viewers who might not know the history behind it. Shiva, Lord Shiva was in a bad mood. He was in a terrible mood. Ma Sati had died due to reasons that were, quite frankly, um, ridiculous. And that obviously upset Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva was in a terrible mood. So he picked up the body of Satima and he started doing the Tandava. And he started uh, spinning, and he was in the ultimate rage. And the whole world started to come to an end. And everyone was observing this and they were like, oh my God, we are all going to be destroyed. We cannot control this. So they all went to Lord Vishnu and they said, please, Lord, you must do something. Otherwise, this all ends. And Vishnu took a Sudarsh the chakra and it goes towards Masati and it, it um, her body gets put into different pieces the, on different places across India. And that's why you have the Sati Pitas. And different body parts fell in different areas of India. That's why you have your holy pilgrimages that you take to Kedarnath or you go to different spots, for example, Kaligat and Calcutta and uh, different body parts fell in, in, in different places. So Ganga Sagar is one place and um, the, uh, the most tantric um, Kamakya is a very sacred place. Kamakya is very dear to me. It is in Guwahati. It's on a hill called Nilanchil in Assam. It is where the Yoni of Ma fell. Out of the different, it's considered very, very sacred because that place and Ganga Sagar, the photo you're looking at, this is a shot of uh, different uh, uh, Babas, Agori Babas. They all have the set up during the Mela in these enclosures, which the temple authorities provide to them uh, during this period in uh, January. And uh, that's why this image was shot. But uh, coming back to the story of Satipita, the place where they are sitting at is one of the, uh, is considered very holy for Hindus, because it's one of the places where uh, you know it's a, it has a piece of Ma over there of Ma Sati. Yeah. I think we are done with the sequence. Yeah, these are again from the same series. You can keep going ahead. If there's anything specific that you want to stop on, let us know. Right? Sure. Just keep uh, scrolling through, Anirudh. Uh, these are all different scenes from Babu Ghat and Ganga Sagar. Uh, you get a lot of people from different parts of Bengal. Yeah, so this you can go to the next one. That is Moni Baba. So when I met him last in uh, 2000, uh, during that January, the same period, uh, actually he was in the shack next to the Baba who had shot previously. Uh, uh, you know, so Moni Baba at that point in time has hadn't spoken in about 25 years. That's why he's called Moni Baba, silent, you know, Mo Monbrath. So you find a lot of interesting Babas there. Uh, there are Babas who have held up their hand like this for literally two to three decades. The arm due to loss of blood circulation is almost skeletal, but different Babas have the different ways where they attain their Siddha. Where they perfect themselves, where they, you know, what's the right, maybe nirvana. And that would be through, uh, for Moni Baba, it was to not speak. For different Baba, they have different uh, means of, of accomplishing uh, that state of mind. So this is Moni Baba. Yeah. So this was the one I was talking to earlier. Very interesting. All of them are characters. They look amazing. Um, yeah. It was just a pleasure to kind of, 
sometimes they will communicate with you depends on the mood sometimes they will not uh, also these journeys took me into the shamshan ghats of uh, different places including bhutnath which is near kamakya which is an ancient uh, agori uh, land you know, where you find uh, well where things go down and sometimes it can be dangerous i guess, assume because you're dealing with babas and uh, they don't want you around at times but i will not delve into stories many times in interviews i've been asked about the specific of what happened but i would not i'll just love to i think that's a private uh, personal experience and like, i would like to keep it to myself but uh, in my opinion there is a real magic world out there it's not filled with just fallacy and fake babas there are a few real ones out there in my experience and uh, okay that's my thought yeah so ari this uh, is uh, a work i wanted to uh, pick your brains on like sure. i think it's some person to my lay person view it looks like somebody is getting hanged this one's i think from 2010 esk uh, it's a acrylic piece on canvas it's called the judas tree it's based on uh, judas iscariot from the bible and uh, this is the scene where uh, he hangs himself from the tree so it's called the uh, judas tree i also have a track it's called uh, iscariot blues it's there on soundcloud or cloud if anyone's interested uh, which was inspired by you know judas and uh, yeah this one was uh, done with uh, non brush elements it was just black acrylic on canvas yeah from maybe uh, 12 13 years ago the scary tree this is again from the same period possibly one of my earlier explorations were while i was getting into uh, the zone of uh, you know the left hand path and the babas and the sadhus and uh, the agoris and all of that it began uh, it was the december i think of uh, 2009 i was watching this late night uh, a documentary on um, a disease called kuru so uh, kuru was a disease which is uh, prevalent amongst a particular tribe in uh, papua new guinea called the fiore so traditionally in that particular tribe when someone uh, someone would die they would consume the body of the dead including the brain matter uh, which would lead to uh, the tribe members who consumed the flesh especially uh, the brain matter to uh, suffer from a disease known as kuru and uh, kuru also is known as the laughing sickness uh, it makes you kind of twitch and uh, make you smile smile a lot i remember the next day i went out uh, to ganga sagar where the earlier photos you showed me and uh, this particular piece kind of came out of that era so i thought of doing a graphic novel which kind of dealt with a virus uh, which overtakes calcutta and it has a lot of influence as i i mixed up the kuru papua new guinea aspect of the tradition of the left hand path of hinduism and uh, added a lot of political commentary on the state of the nation the species and um, all those things and um, that's kind of yeah this piece came out of that period as well what about this this is red devil just to the exploration uh, during that period acrylic on uh, canvas is this red devil from a certain legend or uh, is it like a, no it was just a, just something entirely new random, random thing. thing yeah this is random thing the same period in those the period i still live in calcutta i still live in new baliganj and uh, i think uh, because even the book is a combination of everything goes down in cal so it's I, i guess calcutta would be uh, kolkata would be the primary influence combined with the agori philosophy and uh, the kuru disease and it's a, it's a, a primarily a virus which takes over the world so even for during the pandemic period well we are still in the pandemic period but uh, 2020 i would get a lot of questions and a lot of uh, messages online um, regarding that because that was also about a virus uh, the kuru virus which overtakes calcutta it's kind of a zombie apocalyptic parallel calcutta universe with a lot of commentary on uh, socialism and communism uh, communism and um, gay rights and uh, social issues corruption law enforcement uh, the political system 
mixed with, of course, the virus and the, um, the biological aspects of the virus and um, the repercussions that a virus might have. So all of that. Yeah. And this was done like 2013. So basically so ahead of its time. Like it was ahead of its time. Yeah. So that's the reason why questions come. But now I released the full book. The, release, the book I've been working on since then, since that period, uh, really released Kuru Genesis, which was the first book. But now in about 10 days, we will release uh, Kuru Chronicles, which is what the book is about. As a matter of fact, I should probably a good time to kind of take you around my studio here. Sure. And let me just change. Go into... And a big shout out to Anirudh, because Anirudh, if uh, it was Joe Rogan, Anirudh would be Jamie. And Jamie is always a... Uh, <laughs> Jamie, you can always, <laughs> very, very you can always count on Jamie to hang around. Yeah. That's a compliment. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, so, so uh, these are kind of the original artworks. So this is Kuru Genesis. Uh, my co-conspirator is my friend called uh, uh, Anisha Shrida. Uh, she lives in America. She's the one who um, I kind of created the book and the illustrator behind the book. And Anisha Shrida, my we studied at the Vancouver Film School many years ago. And she was kind enough. She's a writer. She's a very, very talented individual. And she agreed to um, write the book. So it's a collaboration between myself and Anisha Shrida. And anyway, so we did this book in uh, 2013. You know, self-published. It, it's kind of a coffee table introduction to um, what the Kuru Chronicles is about, which we will release in about 10 days. So it's it more of a, well, like it says, uh, creative collaboration uh, amongst myself and uh, Anisha. And um, I'm kind of just going to flip through the book. This is the Calcutta Brief. So these are the origins of Kuru. Uh, as it mentions, uh, you know, in the, in the different images, and uh, there's also the population uh, theory aspect of it, founded by uh, Reverend uh, Thomas uh, Robert Malthus. So can you guys see... Uh, the stuff? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. So, primarily, what uh, these are the inspirations uh, behind and quotes from kind of the book, What of Death Was the Beginning and Birth You Depart, and artworks, and uh, there are a lot of inspirations from the Rig Veda, especially from. Uh, Nasadiya, which is the earliest book of the Rig Veda. It's the first book of Kuru. This is different imagery from the book. Photo manipulated images. Other images. So we did about 100 copies of this book. You guys okay? All right. So, uh, panels from the book. This is Lajagori, um, a figurine from the uh, Northeast. I'm just going to flip through the book. Uh, in influenced a lot by uh, Calcutta. These are different uh, photos I shot in Calcutta. You'll find a lot of the images that we kind of uh, spoke about as well. So, the artwork, my style, in this particular art artwork, uh, as you, these are the originals that you see on my table at the moment. So it's more um, coffee, tea, uh, stains mixed with uh, splattered ink. And this is a bamboo, a character from the book. There's an old Baba who shows... Uh, 
the main character of the book, the way I'm just flipping through random stuff from uh, the book at the moment, different chapters, panels, and uh, the words and the lettering, of course, uh, will come uh, digitally once all these images are scanned onto, uh, you know, a computer. And uh, I'll just flip through Kuru Genesis. The inspirations are photos of Kalima, these of Kamakya in Assam. A lot of, uh, of course, left hand part, Tagori inspirations. Sure. sure. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, this is a very interesting urban sprawl, uh, urban landscape. So what's the story? And it seems like it's uh, almost 20 years back. So what's the story behind this? I, uh, when I was uh, about 19, uh, 20, I used to work in Madras. Uh, I saw all of visual effects and uh, Photoshop and 3D Studio Max and KPT Bryce uh, and Poser and different softwares from 20 years ago. Uh, uh, Maya, of course, Maya Slara. But um, this was more of a sci-fi. I also have a lot of influences. I love old horror stories. Lovecraftian tales, you know, especially Lovecraft stuff, H.G. Wells. I am influenced a lot by um, sci-fi writers and all of that. So this was, the, this was a 3D exploration uh, on KPT Bryce back in the day, uh, composited on uh, Photoshop from, a, you know, if you want the technical answer, but more a spacecape. I always loved space imagery. And this was uh, kind of a earlier, you know, 20-year-old exploration in that realm. And I did a series of them, like 50, 60 of them, which were released. Uh, we were still back in the series in that period. And of course, Google was young and the internet was slow and <laughs> it was a different era. Yeah. I want to ask you how much uh, influence is there of uh, Hindu epics and uh, Hindu gods in your artwork and generally in the uh, underground art scene? Like, of course, you showed some images on uh, Aghori Babas and all, but uh, how much influence is there in the Indian underground uh, art of uh, the, you know, the Puranas and the Vedas and the characters and from our Hindu universe? In my work, there's quite a bit, I think. My work is very, it goes into different zones, but uh, there is definitely the influence of uh, Hinduism and um, uh, in my work. Uh, other artists, again, coming back to my, currently, I really don't consider anything uh, underground anymore, purely because of, um, also we're having this conversation in a very interesting period, in the history of uh, art, the history of the species, because currently in the past two months, what the artificial intelligence algorithms have been doing uh, when it comes to um, the creative field it has been extraordinary and we're all going through a fundamental uh, shift at the moment when it comes to um, you know the entire question of what is art and what is an artwork and uh, well there's a lot of uh, questions to be asked in the very near future because art is uh, just about to get um, democratized and uh, in which it will require no um, Kind of growing skills over a period of time and uh, no you don't re really have to be an artist you don't have to have any skill you will you, you don't have to be able to paint to save your life and uh, you just need an imagination and um, that's where we are at the moment and i think this year next couple of months this year we are just about to walk into that realm where uh, everybody has access to this technology and everyone's just going to be imagining uh, things and then you're going to have many other questions to to ask from uh, yeah like i uh, since you brought up ai uh, what evolution in art work have you seen uh, once the ai has come over in the sense that from handmade art uh, and photography as well <clears throat> if you would consider that in the same realm uh, what mindset change does the movement the shift to ai require how will art of the future look like how different or similar will the experience of art uh, art aesthetics be uh, to someone who is uh, uh, you know uh, 
to the people who are the fan base so yeah both from the artist's point of view and for the consumer's point of view i think the consumer the each and every consumer is going to be an artist in the next couple of months uh why i say this is because uh, purely because of what has happened when it comes to the algorithms and the different uh, ai uh, bots which exclusively deal with visualization at the moment you know for example it could be dali or it could be uh, night cafe or mid journey mid journey is the one where most of my current artworks i've been producing it and the algorithm has got into a place where just about all of us have been shook up not just shook up but are well it's kind of a moment in time where uh, it's like a toy we all always wanted you know where they call it promptism and where you basically primarily imagine uh, something and you prompt it to the ai to the bot and it kind of makes it happen to you you could say a celestial aztec uh, temple on neptune with the style of boris veligio meets uh, franz frazetta with cinematic elements a wide angle shot with a high definition render uh, in the style of um, james cameron meets stanley kubrick you know and this and the bot will imagine it for you in literally a matter of um, less than a minute and what it's doing is it's taking in millions and millions of imagery and all of that and producing its own uh, it's a conversation you're having with the artificial intelligence and it's you're kind of working with it they call it uh, promptism at the moment which is really caught on but what i'm trying to say is this uh, technology is going to be accessible to everybody in the very near future i think which is going to make us all ask uh, certain fundamental questions like uh, right now even the artwork that i create or a lot of us are creating with uh, the help of ai even if we are post producing it in uh, as in we are adding our own touch it's not an exclusively ai artwork but we are adding our own touch in post production softwares like photoshop or other softwares you still have to ask the question about what is an original um, the ethics behind that at the moment not from a legal perspective as well is very um, ambiguous it's very much in the gray zone you know i think this conversation is going to be paramount is already happening and it's just going to gain more ground in the next couple of months because everyone's going to be an artist you are going to be an artist i am going to be the you know from all starters of society each and every one of us on the planet is going to be an artist very soon if not an artist maybe an imagineer an imagineer would be someone who tells the bot to do something and brings out a visual for you and we are in the first generation of it but as far as the art is concerned well we are moving into a vr uh, realm and right now whatever artwork you create i can take it into with disco diffusion and uh, different softwares uh, dali we can take it into a realm of motion where you seamlessly walk through different paintings uh, you know in real time and so it's a very exciting time to be alive and um, in all my ranting i forgot your so uh no so uh, i mean uh, what mindset shift would it require in terms of like like you said that every consumer is now an artist so in terms of that's what that's what's going to happen in terms of aesthetics right uh, what will change number one second thing mm-hmm. uh, which is an observation i wanted to make and i wanted to share with you and you can tell me what you think about this uh you know previously textiles used to be handmade you had hand looms right uh, the indian textile industry was dominant before the colonial period because of hand looms and then the british come uh, post industrial revolution and the power loom comes and they produce things at scale so i can see things art now not being premium or exclusive anymore but i can see it being produced at scale so what impact do you think it will have on aesthetics and art appreciation like and the outcome of art the use of ai i think uh, although i was having this conversation with my friend the other day he's an ar- architect jiggy i think all uh, a lot of uh, professions current professions 
just might possibly go out the window from a design aspect because what the ai can do it gives you variations of uh, the prompt that you give it if i was a client who wanted to build my dream house in the middle of a forest uh, where i have land and i wanted it in different kind of architectural styles maybe i like brutalism and uh, if i told a human architect i want a combination of brutalism and uh, uh, baroque or um, different styles uh, with a touch of minimalism here and i, I don't know you figure out a combination for for a human architect uh, to give me visualizations on it uh, it will take him some time i can literally get it done in a matter of minutes using the ai algorithm you know and it will give me variations literally hundreds of variations of what my dream is and i can fine tune it into exactly how i want it by using you know particular prompts and all of that but even from an artist from concept uh, from a uh, being a con- concept artist working in a pre production studio in a video games company or maybe at ilm or skg dreamworks or you know doing star wars films or in hollywood or wherever it's well i'm just saying it's a interesting uh, period to be alive uh, i think everyone's going to have to change their game a little bit because the clients that you work with uh, in the creative field whether you're an interior designer whether you're a, whether you design automobiles or spacecrafts or any of that maybe you design nuclear reactors designs for nuclear reactors even that as a client as a government if i had access to a technology which gives me a lot more variations from a design perspective i mean why the hell wouldn't i do that so well yeah maybe some of us uh, <laughs> need to up our game or uh, uh, the traditional art artist uh, so ari your your in a way you're saying that uh, artists are going to lose their jobs yeah of course not just artists i think um, uh, well architects and uh, well even doctors are going to lose their job surgeons are going to lose their job when everything gets more automated i mean there's not going to be a requirement for a human brain surgeon or a heart surgeon anymore the future i, I don't think it's a bad thing or a good thing this is our natural course of evolution if you look at uh, darwin's that uh, chart of darwin where you know as a, from a monkey you go through where you come to homo sapien and everything in the middle from neanderthal to you know homo erectus so the different uh, i don't think that picture is complete our uh, ultimate destiny as a species lies in the fusion with technology with the artificial intelligence and uh, it is inevitable so uh, well uh, 10 years 20 years from now you have lung issues a heart issue kidney they're just going to 3d print your pretty print that and the automated surgeons the robots are going to be putting it inside you and everyone's going to live longer and then you're going to have to address the question of technological singularity where we will be immortal and uh, it was uh, i mean what was the collective dream of uh, there are 7.5 billion on the planet today there were 110 billion all time if you have a wikipedia how many humans ever lived the answer is 110 billion are going to wikipedia and uh, well we are going to we are living in the most uh, interesting uh, period in the history of uh, humanity we are it's the collective aspirations and the dreams of all the you know 108 billion who came before us and what was the ultimate uh, what is the ultimate dream of a human in the end immortality maybe Yeah, everyone wanted the fountain of youth well we might just get it through uploading our consciousness into a digital world we already can that wow like uh, it's like the merger of art and science and uh, i wonder what happens to skilled art- artists in the future like the, is it a, is it will it be a dying breed or will they uh, how will hand works evolve like you know in this ai world how would hand drawn artworks well it won't I, i wouldn't like to kill the ai world i love the ai the ai world is a natural progression of the species i don't look at google as something alien i was there when google was born in the 80s google is my old friend you know i have many old friends and i just i think the future of humanity and all the kids that are born in the and i come from gen z you know uh, sorry gen x i uh, gen x are the ones who came between 1965 to 1980 i was born in 1977 i was born the year well elvis presley died i was born the year star wars came out 
you know, uh, 45 years ago, I was born. I'm from Gen X. Uh, I'm also grateful to be born from Gen X because mine was the last generation. Most of my, uh, most of our childhood was analog and most of our adult, li adult life has been uh, digital. We were there at the cusp of, you know, my, from, from listening to radios and black and white televisions and one friggin' uh, channel on television, uh, Durdarsh, you know, uh, and forget cable TV. Cable TV came in the 90s when I was about 13 and that just changed the bloody game. I used to be in front of MTV every Thursday night watching Headbangers Ball, seeing all these amazing uh, visions of seeing these music videos of Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and, you know, it was the early 90s for a kid who had one bloody TV channel and Star Trek and on Sundays with a Hindi movie thrown in in the evening. Well, bloody hell, that was 24 hours of, Jesus, I mean, uh, I don't know, uh, ultimate candy for a kid. And um, then the CDs went out, the tape recorders went out and... Uh, you know how when, I mean, the cell phones came and we will move into a holographic uh, planet very soon. Yeah, uh, pretty interesting stuff there. And, uh, you know, like, I mean, this crystal ball gazing has been fun, but uh, there's a larger stream of thought that I really get from the things you've told. And I want to tie those two knots together. One was which you mentioned about how our civilization has been the oldest and still been a living, breathing civilization, right? And that when you interpolate with the points you made right now, that the evolution of technology is a welcome change. You know, it's something that you really need to, you don't see it as necessarily just the destruction of the old. It's just the addition of new things. So I think one of the hallmarks of our civilization has been how it has been able to evolve with time. And I think that is the larger thought that I get from uh, the things you mentioned. Like it, it's, it's not being static. It's survived because it's evolved continuously. So there is this term, it's called technological singularity. So I think for viewers, a great uh, reference point would be the Elon Musk uh, interview with Joe Rogan uh, during the September of 2018. Uh, was it 19? Anyways, I think it was 18, uh, two years before the pandemic. Yeah. So uh, there is a segment on that where he speaks about singularity. So technological uh, singularity was propounded by uh, Ray Kurzweil. And there are a lot of proponents of it. And I think I also kind of believe in it. A technological singularity is that point in time where artificial intelligence becomes much more intelligent than all the humans and all the computers in the world combined into, I think it's about a thousand or a million fold. I'm not sure. So th that is the point in time which, well, some people, quite a few people, including myself, believe uh, we are heading towards. Now, when this moment occurs, and if, if and when this moment occurs, which I, I believe it will, uh, they've done the mathematics for it, by the way. So the mathematics is something like, uh, uh, it's about seven Nobel Prize winning inventions every second in a minute in a couple of minutes you go through all the nobel prizes in goddamn in history in a matter of a week you have done technological advancement which you would do in hundreds of years within a month i think a month or a couple of weeks you do a thousand years of technological advancement in a month 30 days or a couple of weeks whatever it is after technological singularity they call it the singularity because uh, it's kind of like a black hole. You don't know what is beyond the event horizon. So that's why they, it's a singular event. So from a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, Nick Bostrom from uh, simulation theory, Sam, a lot of proponents of uh, singularity theory, but a lot of them consider, including maybe Michio Kaku with his recent interview with Robert, the, the merge scenario. So there are two things that will happen when that moment comes. Some of us believe that the moment will definitely come. One, AI will not see a reason for us anymore, purely because, I mean, this organism was meant to create me. Now there is no real use for you. So why don't I get rid of you? You know, evolution. We, let's move on to the next phase. Or a, a senior scenario, which is better for us, would be the merge scenario, where we merge with the AI. So, I mean, to quote uh, Musk, you can't beat it, join it. And uh, when that moment comes and all the, with our current uh, capacity as humans, 
I don't think we're ready to go through uh, hundreds of a thousand years of technological advancement matter of weeks. I, I, I think most of our brains, brains would explode. I think all most of humanity is not ready for that stuff. So the MERP scenario, I think, has already occurred. Uh, the coronavirus expedited the process. All our parents, the kids, uh, the kids had to go on Zoom. Every, I mean, classical school changed. Uh, parents uh, could not see their children. Grandparents could not see their grandchildren. And, you know, you could not see your friends. And everybody just got online. And we're already there. The MERT scenario has already begun, first generation. Of course, it moves into the neural links and all of that. But the history, uh, we move into a more uh, augmented reality when it comes to art, uh, to answer your question. There's still images that are being produced that a lot of AI artists uh, produce at the moment. It's just uh, uh, two-dimensional. We are moving into the 3D universe. But soon it will be in that VR augmented really, uh, reality universe where you'll be moving through stuff. We will solve when it comes to, uh, it'll get more engaging. It'll be, you can smell stuff, you can feel stuff with the gloves. You know, research is already being done by Zuckerberg and all different companies around the world to make it a more engaging experience. So in the future, I guess it'll be Ready Player One, kind of Spielberg. And the real OGs when it comes to the human species, I think are the science fiction writers. All the sci-fi writers are the real OGs. We must salute them. They don't get enough credit from the H.G. Wells, from the old sci-fi writers to the modern ones in the modern world. But as far as ancient civilizations are concerned, my belief is our civilization already had, we already achieved singularity. I know we are moving into a pseudo-scientific realm right now, or maybe in a, I believe in the Anunnaki. Uh, if you look at ancient gods, <coughs> if you look at all the gods from different cultures, not just Indian, you look at the Aztec gods, you look at the Egyptian gods, they have an uh, animal head, a human body. It's a symbiosis of the two. Anubis, Horus, you look at Ganesha, uh, you look at M uh, Murugan, uh, Ayapa, my favorite, uh, you know, Hanuman. You look at uh, all the old uh, uh, told, uh, uh, the Mayan gods, uh, you look at the Anunnaki, you know, when it, uh, Mesopotamia, you go to Sumeria. Uh, I, th I, I believe that we already, as ancient civilizations, achieved that realm. Uh, I know everyone has, I mean, people believe in, uh, my God, uh, they believe in all kinds of things. It's a world filled with all kinds of belief systems. This is my belief system. I'm not putting anyone else's belief system out there. But when it comes to ancient civilizations, a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of this morphology between, uh, when it comes to the old gods, between, uh, you know, Horus having owl heads or elephant head when it comes to Ganesha. So it is fascinating. I, I think we came from somewhere else. And I think the old legends have answers in that which um, have been lost in time. So I think the ancient cultures had it nailed here. But India is what? 75 years old? I mean, you, you come from, we come from a civilization which is, my God, man, thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. Here in the Nilgiris, there is a, a place called Kilakothagiri, where there are prehistoric paintings. You know, there are prehistoric uh, symbols which date back 5,000 years. And uh, unfortunately, in 2019, we have get a lot of tourists in these parts. And these, uh, some of these jokers, they came and they put whiteners and they made heart signs and all that stuff on prehistoric paintings. Can you beat that? I mean, that's a, that's a terrible state of affairs. Like, uh, yeah, like it's just a sad state of affairs. Disrespecting, I mean, ancient culture, I mean, uh, the, uh, the tribal, uh, the tribes over there, it's very sacred to them. You know, the Irula tribe uh, in those parts belong there. It's, they have an ancestral link to those paintings. And some of those imagery, you look at it, I promise you, it's like ancient a a astronauts and reptilian figures. And uh, the Western Ghats, where I belong to, uh, is older than the Himalayas. You know, this section of India is older than the Himalayas, which I... So I don't think we respect our history enough. I also think it's a problem with education because even... Okay, let's talk about the right wing and the left wing and everything wing at the moment you know the right wing is exactly where it was but with the right wing is always where it was uh, all time whether it was 10 years ago uh, whether it was 20 years ago right wing is right wing the centrist always in the center so the right wing the centrist the left wing was always bloody here now something i have observed in the past couple of years is has been this left wing armchair uh, how do i put it Maybe I'll put it in a Jordan uh, Peterson perspective. Uh, this left-wing armchair 
social warrior looking for the next cool social cause because you don't want to lose uh, brownie points with your equally woke cool friends you know uh you don't uh, in your echo chambers filled with your cancel culture now what happened in the past couple of years the bloody right wing was here the centrist was here and the left wing was here and all of a sudden the left wing went, went bloody there uh, so you know say up iski iski chodo i'm going to go this way and the and the right wing is standing there the center wing right wing is looking at the centrist and what's going on the centrist is looking at the right and the left wing has gone back i mean the left wing has become more right than the right you know if you had to look at uh, if you had to use that analogy uh you are exactly what all the things you said uh, you were going against initially and of course the algorithms are defining it it's an entirely polarized planet at the moment the last american election donald trump lost by i think 1% of the vote you know the whole world is polarized but the algorithms are doing it but also why is the world polarized is something that people must ask maybe the world has been too politically correct and maybe for the longest time you know my god the scandinavians the swedes the finns who we would consider uh, who are, i mean they're very evolved i mean come on scandinavians are really cool people and you know they they live in a evolved society uh, from different aspects uh, some of the most high highest standards of living on the planet even those guys are going right wing i think what's happening with the planet from a political perspective is balance is being maintained you know for too long if you just flow in one direction well i don't know also when should you forget when should you and i forget you will remember your name your father's name your grandfather's name your great grandfather's name maybe your great great grandfather's name maybe five generations what you will forget is it took two people to make you it took four people four, four into the next generation it took eight into the uh, four generations down or three generations down 16 four generations down 32 just five generations you go into 10 generations you're looking at hundreds of people who are responsible for for you to be here today for you or me to be here so when do i forget so so is there a rule book which tells me that oh i okay theek uh, you know what happened after grandfather is forgotten and that is the rule uh, or do i forget or it's the 10 generations or 20 generations when do i forget do i forget my civilization where i come from is there a right time to maintain the balance of this why is the whole world going right wing why is india so polarized today why is america so polarized today why is the whole world so polarized maybe for too long you went in a certain direction and maybe the balance is off right now you know completely off what goes for the goose goes for the gander maybe certain communities and certain religions just want it is my way or the highway i am afraid in 2022 it that doesn't work out if you go on this realm if you belong to that agenda my way or the highway you are going out it will there will be no uh, people to curse at whatever to do in the future because ai will do it for you you know you uh, and we are just heading towards that and uh, the world is more polarized because of the algorithms and uh, we'll get to hold uh, and from a civilization perspective when should one forget when should one forget you tell me i don't have the answer to that i think one i don't know there is a history to everything i mean let's not humans forget according to their convenience what's convenient for you or take it let's forget about it but that's just a question i have i'm not bashing anybody i'm not bashing any religion i'm just saying that's the way it is all over the world and i think one should uh, too many mexicans r- right now remember the the aztecs or worship the aztec gods or kuku Kuk- or, or whoever the or people in south america worship the mayans how many egyptians worship horus or ra uh you know at least the indians are still have some sense of not just history about but civilization which spans uh you know a long period of time so i think the left wing people have become much more right wing than the right wing a lot lot more in the past well couple of years the algorithm of course is working all of us but yeah, yeah uh, that's uh, very true and uh... i think with that we come to the end of our conversation i think it's been a wonderful discussion with you ari uh, navigated a lot of things uh, we've covered so much ground uh, and uh, it's really great to know that uh, because there's always this feeling uh, that many people have at least something that has been reinforced by popular culture or mass media that artistic and creative people are not in touch with their culture and roots but uh, people like you actually really give all of us hope that uh, we can embrace modernity 
but at the same time we can still be rooted in our civilizational values so i think that's been my uh, biggest learning from this discussion i really appreciate you giving us time uh, for this discussion and uh, it's been really insightful and uh, that's all i want to say and for the viewers who are watching the show thank you so much for uh, uh, thank you thank you very much for yep having me yep and for been a pleasure yes absolutely mm-hmm. and for the viewers who are watching the show please subscribe to our channel like share comment and subscribe and uh, until next time always remember dharma rocks see you around